what made you think that journalism needs a school? That there, why, why, why don't you just become an engineer and write about science and then go get a job? Um, Those days are gone forever. Uh -huh. Look, uh, there are a lot of reasons to go to a particularly a graduate school of journalism now that weren't the case several years ago. Um, for the first time since the advent of broadcast television, there's something new to learn. You have to learn to do multimedia interactive journalism that can be personalized to an audience of one. You have to know how to use social media. You have to know about tablet computers. Um, so there's really a lot more for students to learn, and you cannot learn it on the job the way we did. We all had mentors and people who helped us along, and everybody has been so thinned down now, and everybody is so busy doing five jobs at once. It was simple in the old days. You put out a magazine, and that was it. You know, now the reporters are blogging and podcasting. And but when you were thinking about starting a journalism school, you were still, you know, at Business Week, not having you know, that fully clear in your mind. I mean, even as you write in the book, you were thinking about that you'd have different tracks, one for print, one yeah. for television, one for yeah. internet. You, yeah. So the idea that it was all coming together wasn't in your head when you said, let's, let's, let's do a journalism school. Um, what wasn't in my head was that we should just converge all the tracks into one and teach everybody everything. But what, what was in my head uh, when we started was that everybody had to learn the techniques of, of doing interactive multimedia journalism. Mm. But yeah, I mean, when we started, there was no Twitter. Facebook had barely started. There were no iPads. There were no mm. computer apps. I mean, there's been a second revolution since we started. We yeah. thought we were getting in on the ground floor um, only to have it change on us. The good thing about starting from scratch is that not only can you, you don't have any entrenched faculty, old courses, to get rid of. You can start with the future in mind. We didn't get everything right, but I think directionally we had it right. But more important, we retained the spirit of a startup. And to this day, in our seventh year, I think we feel that we're still a startup and still changing the curriculum as the world changes. Was the desire to bring a different kind of student with different experiences into journalism, or was it to do something new with journalism that, that people would be the beneficiary. Yeah, the latter, to do something about journalism education, which would help people who want to be journalists. Because I think the reason that people go to journalism school today is really not very different from why they went um, several years ago to Columbia, say, uh, which was they have a passion to be journalists, OK? Mm -hmm. That is what we look for in students today. They know that it's going to be much tougher than it used to be. They know it's hard to get jobs, although they're doing very, very well mm -hmm. in the job market. Um, they know what they're getting themselves into. And this is a graduate school, and the average age is 27 years old. Mm -hmm. So these are not kids, although there's some right out of college, 22. But by and large, they know what, they're, they're not naive about it. They're, they're coming to learn how to be journalists in this world. And I, I think we're just, it's the same tradition of a journalism school and I imagine, you know, when television news came along, uh, you know, in the 1950s, late 40s, early 50s, journalism schools then had to adjust to that new world as well. So, but New York had journalism. So, I mean, that Columbia has been there forever. NYU, years, yeah. NYU has a school. Yeah. Um, what made you think that CUNY could do something that would be different? That that wouldn't just replicate what was already being done. What the main thing. There were two reasons to start the school. The main thing that would make us different is that we were starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have to undo anything, and we could start with a view to the future. But the second thing, of course, is that there's no publicly supported graduate school of journalism, not just in New York City, the media capital, but in the entire Northeast. Mm -hmm. So just think about this. There were students, and I know about this because I grew up that way. There were students who couldn't afford the tuition at the very good private universities. And therefore, they wouldn't be able to go to journalism school? That didn't seem right. So the chancellor of CUNY, Matthew Goldstein, had the idea of starting a graduate program in journalism. And it was a brilliant idea. So yes, the timing was right. And we could differentiate ourselves from the existing schools because we could be on the cutting edge much sooner. But a different kind of school from the school you went to. I mean, you, a number of these 
kids that you indicated had to, you had to do some remedial training with as once they got there. You mean, I mean uh, it, now at the now, Jones School? Yeah. No, it isn't so much remedial training. Yeah. I mean, you know, the students, this is true of just about all graduate schools of journalism. If you're 26 years old and going to journalism school, it is often because you're what we call a career changer. You know, you, some of them went to law school, some of them worked on Wall Street, some of them worked in book publishing, and they just decided at 26 years old they really wanted to be a journalist and they'd have no experience in their, ba in their backgrounds. And so you have to give them uh, an intense amount of the core of going out and covering a neighborhood in Brooklyn and rushing back to our newsroom and writing a story and by the way, you better have a camera with you mm -hmm. and teach them how to do that. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, uh, that's not remediation. That's just mm -hmm. teaching students at the level they come in with. There are mm -hmm. some students who come with a fair amount of journalism mm -hmm. background, and they're very, very good writers. They don't know the new stuff. Mm -hmm. Or the other way around, they know the new stuff, and they, they've never done any real reporting. Where would you go for faculty? Um, well, that was pretty easy because, you know, in New York City, it's, uh, it was pretty good. We have a a small um, core faculty, there are about a dozen faculty. There are 100 students. It's a year and a half master's program, 100 students come in in the fall. Um, and in the fall, we also have the third semester students coming back. So in the fall, the population is 200 students. There are 12 core faculty, full-time faculty, and there are about 10 what we call consortial faculty teach somewhere else in the city university system, including three or four Pulitzer Prize winners. And then we, like every other school in New York, tap the adjuncts, tap the profession for adjuncts, and it's a very rich pool. So we get a lot of people who come mm -hmm. in and teach, mentor the students, help them get internships and jobs. I think you know it's a blessing to be in New York uh, to, to do this and to tap into this rich pool of people, and they really want to help. Mm -hmm. And if you need somebody who's going to be able to teach um, visual storytelling for the web, you can find people in New York and they come in and they teach that one course. So it's very economically efficient. You don't have to put them on the faculty. They come in and they're delighted to teach the one course because they're working somewhere else. And it's great. You were editor of Business Week for 20 years and in a tradition that goes back to Gutenberg, it was very much what we call a one-to-many model. Mm -hmm. And you as editor decided this week it's India, next week it's going to be Bill Gates. Um, then we'll do a, we'll throw in an investigative piece. <clears throat> and um, you come to this school at a time when all of those presumptions are being challenged, where, um, if you will, we can now look back on it and say with it, with the combination of, of mobile, of social media, of, of uh, cloud computing, um, that um, people pretty much decide what they want to read, what they want to write about. Um, uh, the idea of the omniscient editor is, is really being challenged um, extraordinarily in the business. How did, how did you personally deal with that and were there surprises along the way that, um, that you, where you found yourself just a different person today than you were when you started this? Yeah. Let me just back up and say the most fundamental change is the way people consume media today. You know, in the old days, you'd get your daily newspaper and you'd sit down and you'd browse through it and read whatever interested you, but you paged your way through the paper in general. And on average, people spent about 45 minutes with their daily newspaper. Um, in the internet age, that has changed completely. People will go to the home, rarely go to the home page of a, of a newspaper and start reading it the way they re read the print paper. They will go to read a single article, usually sent there by a Google search or a Facebook friend. They stay on average for three minutes, and then they flit on like a bumblebee to go into another flower, to, to another story, another website. So now, that they the, come back to that brand again, well, or not necessarily. Well, this undermines the brand equity of all right. these papers because the atomic unit of journalism became not the newspaper or magazine, but the individual article. Okay, there's a fundamental shift mm -hmm. in the way people consume media. Mm -hmm. But psychologically, it had an amazing effect on all of us who were editors of these mm -hmm. place, places, which were one to many, in, in, in this way, that our job, which we took very seriously, and we thought of ourselves as professionals, was to decide what was 
important and to filter information for the readers who can't mm -hmm. possibly be on top of everything that's going on. Tell you what's important, tell you what it means, provide analysis, context, understanding, and on our best days, something approaching wisdom. And all of a sudden, that changed. And the editorial product became a process. It became a two-way street. It became a conversation with the audience. And more important, anybody could be a journalist mm -hmm. or at least commit an act of journalism. You know the A.J. Liebling famous line, you know, yeah. the freedom of the press yes. belongs to those who own one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, now no. everybody owned one. And so we were sort of dethroned, you know, mm -hmm. our role as the professional taking this very seriously to serve the readers was upended. And it, I think that for people of my generation who grew up a certain way and ran these magazines and newspapers, it was a psychic shock. Mm -hmm. And I, that was, the, I think, the hardest part for a lot of us. You know, we understand about technological shifts. They've happened all throughout history. Mm -hmm. But the psychological, but not <laughs> yes, not to us, and yes, yeah. the psychological shock was really, I think, difficult. Yeah.